understand the networking within the data center and also take you to the internet, right? If you look at the conventional model, be the data center network defined by uh, any of the big network players, you would essentially see that you have three layers, right? Uh, the core network, then the access, then the distribution, right? So pretty much that's how the network was, right? And now when you program this network, they are pretty much there forever. The changes are minimal, right? But whereas with cloud, what happens, right? At any snapshot of that time, if you look at Amazon's network, it would be different from, say, 10 minutes or even 2 minutes from that time snapshot. The reason is people come and people go out, right? And with VPC, Amazon has to provision the network of various customers at scale, right? You don't really... Uh, feel the power with which we use VPC, but think about the admins or the network strain on the Google Cloud providers, or the cloud providers be Google or Amazon, right? So if you look at it, if you go with the conventional model of allowing the routing stack to sort of converge for a particular point A to point B, it's going to take time, right? So that is what the SDN essentially creates Entry and exit announcements have been turned off for all meeting participants. Wish, right? Which means the business is at the focus and network are essentially de designed around the business, right? Now, with, this is pretty much with respect to the cloud networking, right? Let's move on to the telco. I'm from the telco world, right? Now, if you look at the telco network, right? So the mobile phone we began using just for calls, right? Then we, we moved on to using uh, data. Then we moved on to video, right? But with 5G, you would essentially see a paradigm shift, or we need to be prepared for addressing the 5G needs, which is IoT and other uh, things like live streaming, so on and so forth, right? So if you look at it, assuming that you are a service provider, right? This network is pretty much static in nature, right? You would essentially provide uh, his radio base stations, he would have a mobile backhaul, and he would have the core network. This is pretty much fixed, right? But let's assume that, for example, there is a live event in, uh, say, for example, the uh, Levy Stadium, right? Suddenly you see the network demand increasing in the particular pocket of the region, right? Can the current static network be able to meet the needs? May not be, right? So that is where there are new architectural patterns that would essentially enable you to come out or come out with new network architectures, right? Um, so with that introduction, let me get into the agenda. Um, so today I'm planning to cover a bit of microservices, then VNF, what is the characteristic of it, uh, the current open source ecosystem, which means can I build my own, uh, say, network with the open source tools, right? And then uh, I'm going to get into a bit of NFE architecture, and also come up with the common design patterns uh, and problems in VNF deployment. Okay. So what is microservices? I saw a lot of uh, hands, so probably one of you can volunteer to see what microservices is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is decomposition of more anything, true. Uh, but it was present even earlier as SOA, right? Service Oriented Architecture. This is pretty much in the enterprise application space. Other than that, I, I fully agree that it's basically decomposition of monolithic. Second, any other point? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool. I think both are uh, uh, important points from microservices. Uh, but nevertheless, I just want to think a bit on a different plane. These are very, very important valid points, and I'm just going to add to what they said. Uh, when we began our software development, when you wrote your first software, uh, what was the constraint you had? Or let's assume you took an inverted platform. What were the constraints you had? Sorry? Yes. 
memory memory os time constraint okay valid points right so because we are live casting so people in the audience should speak on microphone you can repeat sure uh, so the answers were essentially uh, memory time um, so rather i would say these are the resource constraints right so you take any software it would come with a pre requisite that this would run on a particular hardware on a particular memory with a hard disk as well as memory requirements right and as per network requirements with cloud native with cloud coming in right the paradigm is shifting right at any point of time i can request for unlimited compute unlimited network unlimited storage right so in the case the software i develop should i still constrain it to a that of the requirements that is imposed to die yes or no so they constrain my software to that of the um, what are the requirements i have mentioned no right right so in order to exploit the cloud nativeness right your architecture has to evolve right so how do i evolve the architecture so let's assume that you develop a software when you deploy it on a on a particular environment if they want to add or scale what do you do you probably add one other node and then basically put a load balancer in front of it and then say that's a scale right let's assume that you use only 40% of the software your customer uses only 40% of the software they use and they say can i get only 40% you you can't really customize it for their requirement right so even if there are like 10 instances that are running you need to have that extra 60% being deployed in all those instances because it is single monolithic software right so these are some of the important driving factors and i am going to get into how using microservices we can get both scale as well as exploit the cloud nativeness of the platform okay so just to, this is uh, basically for people uh, who are not familiar with uh, microservices you can go to martin flower he is sort of i would say guru of uh, software architecture he has a lot of white papers on microservices and you can get into it so just to give a, a example as people are saying uh, martin flower i'll give you the url there so this is the uh, the normal software we have right you have basically the application and it has a database it directly connects with it with microservices as people are mentioning those are independent smaller components that can be put together to form a particular software whatever you intend to need okay so what are the principles that drive microservices architecture right so the first principle is services must be loosely coupled so that they can be developed deployed and scale independently this is the most important principle I, that drives microservices right then the other important thing that would be important to vnf context is decentralized data management these two things are the most important with respect to microservices architecture that is relevant to vnf and other principles are organized around business capabilities when i say organized around business capabilities i take a decision to divide my software into smaller components i have to draw a line somewhere right how do i draw that line that would be based on how your business needs or how your software is designed based on the business capabilities uh, other important point uh, that was already mentioned is api focused when there are two monolithic uh, not monolithic microservices based uh, components they would talk via api smart endpoint and dump pipes this is a very important factor right what is a pipe what i mean what do you recollect if someone says pipe something that moves in the software context yes unix pipes right what do you unix right ps minus cs pipe grip what does it do it just pipes right but if you look at the software architecture there are smart pipes when you have smart pipes examples are they essentially introspect what's going on 
right? But in case of microservices, the important thing is the pipes have to be dumb, whereas the endpoints have to be smart. The reason is, in case of the monolithic software, the message passing was happening within memory, but here it is happening over the network, which means you need to have a very high speed messaging ecosystem to build a successful microservice. So that's what it's called as smart endpoints and dumb pipes. Decentralized governance, I'll probably touch upon with an example later. Infrastructure automation, which is another important component, designed for failure, which means your system, for example, if there are 10 microservices in your software, you should be prepared to continue even if one or two fails. What it means is the functionality related to those two components would not be available, whereas all other eight components would be available. And of course, evolutionary design, which I will probably get into. Okay, network function evolution. Have you ever thought about, say, for example, 10 so, years before? Uh, a question here, then. So when you say design for um, microservices to come down, mm -hmm. do you also talk about like high availability, like yes. duplication of microservices? Yes. Okay. Absolutely, yeah, you're right. 10 years back or even 5 years back, have we ever thought about running a virtual router? Why? Okay, then. Okay, fine. So, pretty much what has happened is the network was treated to be fit. Right. They are specialized, right? So any network lab in an organization would be at most because that's treated to be the lifeline for any business, right? And all this hardware, if you look at the margins of most of the vendors, it would be minimum of 60%, right? Even they would probably bundle their software on a hardware platform and sell it as a software. You know that for sure, those software, they can be downloadable and they can be I mean, installed in your server. They would not sell it because that's about more margin, right? Second thing is all of it was proprietary. There is no uh, open source stack that was available, right? Which means that at any point of time, if you ask for a particular feature in the software, you have to wait for six months to one year, right? So with virtualization that, uh, that opened up a lot of new architecture and we got VNF, which stands for Virtual Network Function. PNF stands for Physical Network Functions, right? Now, what's the difference between PNF and VNF? When the VNF started, what people did was they typically in a physical uh, network function, you have, pro, uh, you have a platform dependent uh, path. What is meant by platform dependent part is, for example, you have line cards, you have uh, control cards. So these are pretty much running on a processor, which is network processor, right? So you cannot really think about moving it and running it in a virtual life. So what people did was as part of the evolution, they removed or created a layer, which they call it as platform independent part, PI. Right? and then ran it on a virtual uh, network function. I still can see certain vir virtual network function that calls for specialized open, sorry, uh, COTS hardware. They say, yeah, it is virtual, but still we need this particular hardware requirement, right? So because of it's totally tightly bound with that of the underlying hardware, right? So that's how it uh, evolved. But with microservices, what's happening is the whole barrier is gone. Whole barrier has to go. The reason is microservices are in a way totally disjoint from the top beat hardware as well as the software imposition or rules that you put in it. Right? So for now, I was referring to that example wherein let's assume a customer uses only 60% of the uh, feature that you sell, right? If you ask for it, you cannot do it because you cannot divide it to smaller components. But with microservices, you can do it. 
so future probably in 2 years or probably even in 3 years i can basically deploy a virtual network function based on what a customer needs on his deployment which means there would be a layer above the vns that would compose the network functions on demand on requirement okay so that's what we are heading towards okay i'll probably pass a moment and i'll take some questions if there are yeah. it it may be just uh, the diagram it shows but is there a reason why you say from pnf hardware to this evolution directly versus vnf to that or is there a okay. is there a so that's a good question so the reason uh, the question here is in the diagram i have shown pnf to that of microservices vnf directly uh, i'm just showing that uh, the reason being if you are a pnf based if you if you are a vendor who sells pnf instead of going to a vnf you can directly look at rearchitecting your network function based on microservices okay there is nothing that is stopping you from going from vnf to microservices i'm not saying that what i'm trying to say is if you are making any decision you do have a path to go from pnf directly to microservices based vnf okay and another important aspect here is in the vnf there is no architecture change there might be architecture change but it might be in terms of configuring your network function right as i said you are removing the platform in dependent part and creating it as a bundle right and putting it in a virtual network function of course i'm not saying you would definitely optimize it but there is no architectural change in the component right yes you can divide your vnf into a microservices base again the most important thing is microservices is a change in architecture right it is costly i'm not saying that it's it's it's, it's an easy thing to just take a, a pnf and then put it into smaller chunks and then say this is a, a microservice because in microservices each one of it is autonomous nature which means you have a overhead of debuggability you have a overhead of message passing all of it has to be considered right if you expect that your microservices would be deployed on a bit on a cot and then say hey my performance there is a performance impact yes there would be performance impact because it is meant to design for scale and it is meant to design for composability right that's the reason you need to be looking at seriously on whether i need to go for microservices if yes what is the best design pat- paradigm i need to use to come out with network function again one rule or one solution cannot fit all of the uh, deployment scenarios that's a very very important thing yeah a uh, question here do you mean that microservice vnf does remove the dependency of running on top of hypervisor is that what that is that is the reason i have mentioned it is a microservice run time right when i say run time a microservice can be based on vm it can be based on containers okay so that's where i have put Either it as way. a generic microservice run time it can be hypervisor or it can be a container run time environment okay so hypervisor does not become a prerequisite it is not a prerequisite okay. thank you okay so let me move on i'll probably take questions at the end of the session okay so as i said i also want to just put one other question i said about scalability what is the scalability we are talking about if i want to meet the scale needs what do i put i create multiple copies of it or clones of it and then put a load balancer and then scale or try to increase memory and then uh, increase the cores and then try to scale it in a different way right but with microservices i can basically scale x and y right so this particular slide talks about the three dimension of scaling and the y axis corresponds to microservices wherein you can do a functional decomposition and you can scale both horizontal as well as vertical okay and uh, why do i need to go for microservices vnf i am pretty much happy my customers are happy why do i need to go the reason is business needs 5g and iot okay both are going to essentially drive the need or load on 
Vienna, and also it's, you need to be having real-time scale. I said real-time scale, so that's what you need. Next is hardware evolution. As uh, Sujata was pointing, hardware is also basically one of the key that's uh, fueling it. If you look at o OCP, OCP stands for Open Compute uh, Platform. So there is also already a thought switch that is available that's based on microservices, that enables microservices. Elasticity, tolerance, agility, API-based, uh, then central orchestration. Another important point is in a monolithic software, the control is within the software, whereas in microservices, it's, it would be from the orchestrator. Okay, and then predictability, wherein you can basically upgrade as well as testing. If time permits, I'll get into uh, what is meant by A-B testing and canary testing. Then I'll move on to uh, life cycle. So I was mentioning that there are a lot of advantages of microservices, one being upgradability, right? Since these software components are independent in nature, I can basically have a release cycle wherein I can just update this component that got changed, that got upgraded, right? Instead of doing a monolithic upgrade, I can just pick and choose specific software that can be upgraded. So that is where continuous integration, continuous deployment plays a very, very important role. This is also an important thing in case of DevOps. For people who are aware about DevOps, CI, CD is the most important thing. The intent is, I would essentially keep on developing software and then I would be uh, continuously upgrading my software. So you have CI and CD and monitoring. What is meant by monitoring is, I can also look at the health of the system and then give feedback to my workflow manager or orchestrator. That can take a decision on whether it's a software problem, I need to basically uh, look at upgrading that particular component, right? And the most important thing here is, also, in case of the telco, in case of the VNS, you need to be aligned with that of the business needs. Because in case of enterprise, the deployment would be a bit simple. Whereas in case of telco, there are a lot of requirements. Requirements in terms of getting it certified, a lot of cycles are there. So you also need to ensure that this gets plugged into the system. Of course, it makes you easy. You can basically send selective components for certification and get it deployed in your running system. Another important thing is the workflow manager and orchestrator. Uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, Tosca or uh, BPMN? Okay. So what does Tosca do? So Tosca essentially, it helps you to define a workflow. What is meant by workflow is, for example, your business need. Let's say, for example, you have a, uh, EPC, right? Evolve Packet Core. Or familiar, are people familiar with EPC, Evolve Packet Or BNG? Okay. Or, uh, okay, let's, for simplicity's sake, uh, let's take a simple enterprise solution, right? What, in, in case of enterprise solution, primarily there are three layers, right? Web tire, middle tire, and database tire, right? Now let's assume that you have, uh, this is a classic example that any cloud provider would do to meet his scale needs, when there is a peak performance, what he does is he would, the customer can essentially create a VPC in uh, Google Cloud or Amazon and then create a software instance. What does he do when he say, create the software inter instance? He would, would need to install the would essentially mean to provide a particular thing. For example, he has to install web tire, he has to install uh, the middle tire, middleware tire and then database tire, right? So when he does it, how can he automate it to do it? How can he automate? On a click of a button, I need to deploy it, right? What you need to do is you need to say, for this particular web tire, I need this, this type of order, hardware. For a middle tire, I need these requirements. So you basically put together in a template, and then deployment system would read the template and deploy it, right? So that is what, meant by, what I meant by workflow manager. A workflow manager is one that can know what is the requirement of particular software, what are the hardware needs, you can read the template and then deploy it, right? Another thing is orchestrator. When I say orchestrator, I was mentioning to you, right? Microservices are independent components and they can be scaled both vertically and horizontally. How is it possible? Let's assume that you have five components in, in your software. Out of these five components or microservices, 
I can essentially create three uh, component one, two component two, and then one one component three and four and five. Right? This can be in a particular deployment. In a second deployment, I can create four instances of component one, two instances of other components. Right? Which means what happens is look at in a monolithic way there are single instance of this components. Right? In a microservices. It's, it can be varied depending upon what I want, right? In that case, an orchestrator plays an important role because an orchestrator exactly knows what is the requirement and which component has to be scaled, okay? So that's the reason you, have, you need to have both workflow manager and orchestrator. Any questions? Okay, so this is the HCNFE architecture. How many of you are familiar with HCNFE architecture? Okay. So NFC architecture is, this is a standard body and this is basically defined by them on how a network function virtualization uh, needs to be. So you have different layers. Uh, you have the virtualization, this is called the uh, NFE I layer. This is the VNF layer and this is the uh, OSS BSS layer. And you have also the NFE management or orchestration, right? Now, here we are talking about just the VNF, right? We are talking about a microservice based VNF. If you have microservice based VNF, you cannot just deploy it in any system. Your underlying NFVI has to support it, your underlying orchestrator has to support it, and also your management and orchestration has to support it. Right? So it's not just one layer you, are, you get into microservice and I will have all fit whatever I need. Right? It's, it's not possible. Right? So now, just look at this and then I'll probably try to map uh, what are the open source tools that are available. Okay, so this is the design pattern I just wanted to show you for reference. Uh, it's a bit uh, de in detail. But out of those design patterns, what are the design patterns that we can use? Right? The first one is decomposition pattern. What is meant by decomposition pattern is, I have a monolithic, how do I divide it into smaller components? One can be your organizational boundary. Right? Another can be your business needs. Third can be your subdomain context. You can look at it and then create a subdomain, uh, boundary based on subdomain context. And please remember, once you have these microservice components, they would be there independent of other components. So you need to be really taking care of everything that is related to dependency, right? Next is the service discovery pattern. A service discovery pattern is one that will essentially tell you what are the services that are being added to the system so, so that you can make use of it. This is also relevant in terms of failure. The uh, third one is database that service pattern. In the monolithic world, there is one database or few databases, and the database tier is the one that talks to the system. But here you need to separate it out because each of these components, they can exist or they may not exist, right? So in that case, these database per service pattern, there are guidance or guiding rules that would essentially help you to design those databases. In fact, how the whole microservice or container started was, it was started as a stateless, right? Do you remember if you recollect Docker or any other container system, they were designed for that there wouldn't be any state in the machine. They run and go. But now the whole paradigm is changing and they are adding a database layer to it so that you can use containers for even your applications that need a, a persistence. Okay. Next is circuit breaker. A circuit breaker pattern provides you, for example, if you are dependent on a service, if it fails, how can you either retry or basically break out of it? So that's another pattern. And the third one is API gateway pattern. This is another important pattern wherein you can do a lot of, uh, uh, like for example, uh, analytics around what type of calls that are going on, if you want to do a load balancing, if you want to do other related uh, uh, routing around APIs, the API gateway pattern would be of help to you. There are many other design patterns, but these are the design patterns that are relevant to VNF. That's the reason I've just put it here. Uh, next, let me get into the open source ecosystem. Um, so from a workflow manager perspective and orchestrator, how many of you are familiar with own app? Okay. So 
okay so i'll, I'll have a, i have a own app slide uh, so own app is uh, basically a open source software and the linux foundation uh, it was born out of two projects one was called ecom from atnt another one is open move from china mobile they got merged and that is where own app is aria is uh, again open source from cloudify this is basically a tosca uh, engine wherein you can design tosca templates and the to- using aria you can deploy those tosca templates uh, then of course there is osm uh, which was which was gaining momentum but with the uh, own app it sort of i would say that uh, it's i haven't heard much about osm um next is the design and deployment as i was mentioning the ci cd is an important component uh, you would be familiar with jenkins but there is also a fabric 8 and other options are go cd uh, ansible puppet tensor um, execution environment or nfpi um, so that can be built using kubernetes open daylight and obs or kubernetes uh, with there are other options um, like open contrail i believe there is a session uh, today about open contrail um, and also you have uh, uh, the fido and alternate to obs where you can use it as a data plane then you have a service mesh is the uh, i can probably talk about it after the session because uh, i believe uh, i have just 10 minutes uh, another important thing is uh, monitoring uh, wherein you need to look at each of these microservices look at their uh, stats and then provide this process feedback to the orchestrator so the uh, monitoring framework that is available in open source is called prometheus i have also captured an alternative sort of other alternatives this particular url provides a comparative study of various monitoring tools tracing uh, tracing is another important thing where for example you make a call you need let's assume that there is a issue with your call so you need to probably trace so there is a something called as open tracing which is a distributed tracing and there is also an implementation called zipkin uh, so this is another important uh, component that is used in microservices to trace uh the uh, call flow the last one is logging uh, you would need to essentially look at having a distributed uh, logging framework so that you can have a single dashboard to see what are the logs how do they correlate to elk stands for uh, elastic search log stash and kibana uh, this is equivalent to the top of splunk which is a proprietary one elk is open source and you can use it even for any of the softwares uh okay so another important thing is vnf deployment so there is a question about uh, whether the microservice based vnf need to be on a hypervisor right so there is no requirement as such but going forward the deployment would be typically like this assuming you don't talk about vnf the deployment would essentially be your microservices some of it would be based on vms some of it would be only containers some of it would be both microservices as well as containers and you would have uh, uh, the open stack platform to orchestrate vms kubernetes to orchestrate containers so this how it's going to be so i'm just showing the complexity with which the real deployment would be and how an orchestrator system plays a very important role to orchestrate it so i'm just trying to map so as i was mentioning the uh, some time back we were talking about microservice based vnf but you need to have a complete ecosystem so on the nfpi uh, you have kubernetes open daylight and obs or fido or open stack open daylight and fido you have own app to architect it you do have the mano open source mano which is the osm so you do have already have work in progress to have the complete stack to realize this particular hcnf architecture and also uh, there is a open source project called opnsv that puts all of it together um they tend to pull all these uh, open source projects together and bundle it uh, they are still working on the microservices and i'm involved in certain projects uh, around microservices this uh, ona um basically they have two things uh, one is the design time where i was mentioning it helps you to do uh, service design and creation and policy and on a run time these are some of the components which we already looked at okay i was trying to see if i can cover tosca but i think for uh, uh, lack of time i'll probably skip it okay so this is one of the project i am driving in open daylight um this is more of the nfpi uh, layer what you are trying to do is we are trying to integrate open daylight with 
uh, open stack as well as uh, uh, with kubernetes uh, here there are two types of deployment one deployment is in a hybrid deployment where you have both vm as well as open sorry, vm as well as containers we are leveraging a project called courier that would essentially uh, bind both of these environments together and we also have a bare metal where if you have just kubernetes uh, for the network part of it uh, we are using open daylight um, to have a session uh, today afternoon where i'm getting into uh, more details about this project if you're interested you can join that session uh, yeah with that i'm opening it up for uh, q and a so this is a very very uh, common uh, um, i would say message that most of the microservices sessions would have but it is important microservices is not just designed it is also about how your organization structures are the reason being in case of monolithic at least you can be pressurized by a single organization to meet your deadline but when it becomes more autonomous what happens is you need to be really really thinking at the whole organization as a, as a complete component and you need to play an important role in meeting the common goals nevertheless what it talked about it any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization communication structure what it means is since this microservices will talk with api let's assume that you have agreed with a particular api if you don't meet it you are basically uh, impacting the release okay with that i'll probably open up for questions and we have time for a couple of questions but we have another webcast following so we need to kind of move on so we'll take two and then you're going to be around all day and lunch and you can have a lot of time to talk to them so i should get get some grace then because i started <laughs> Can you give me more insight of the ONAP versus like the, the currently we're using Ansible or uh, Terraform, uh, this type of thing? What's your feedback on those and compared to ONAP and the future development? Thanks. Sure. Um, so that's an important question. Um, so the Ansible or Puppet uh, or Terraform for that matter, they basically take a specific use case. What they do is their goal is automation, right? So they would essentially look at the whole environment you define the profiles that is needed and to look go and probably provision it and look at if there are any issues i mean you you can completely write the workflow that is needed for that automation right onap is much more uh, bigger than that right the reason is if you look at as i was showing in the nfa uh, uh, or nfhc architecture you have the complete oss bss layer right so oss bss layer is is a monster i would say that is the heart of all the telco system right so onap in a way has to work in it, it has to fill up certain components of the oss bss if not all so it's much more the scope is larger than that so also if you look at a typical deployment you would have multi sites you would have uh, the uh, van connecting all those sites so if you look at it it has to cover multi sites first is at a multi site then within the site then you need to manage so the orchestration is in in fact a very interesting area because you have service orchestration you have infrastructure orchestration so each of it has its uh, own uh, scope and domain so onap in a way tries to cover all of it all of this layer together and it's still it, it has to be a, it will be api based yes Yes, I the telco. It's a telco thing. Yes. So uh, when you're talking about the microservices, you mentioned that um, each service can be upgraded independently, right? That's right. So is, are there any tools around the version compatibility management in the sense, let's mm -hmm. say, upgrade one service that does, is not compatible with the older one? Mm -hmm. Are there any tools that? So I I came across. Uh, few weeks back about a slide that essentially takes care of it uh, i can probably share that uh, uh, it's this automation tool that essentially look at version compatibility and the other areas because as i was talking about i couldn't cover uh, the testing part of it because it's a very very interesting problem in case of ab testing if you have 10 components 
you can selectively in a testing environment you can select you have three components that are from a new version other seven components from a older version also when you deploy you can have test traffic routed to this particular environment so of course there are tools that are coming out to address this yeah. question on a short chat and question that usually defined by the vendor that you're working with that really by the so tosca is a standard from oasis so what you can do is you can basically define it as what you want mm -hmm. and then uh, that gets uh, executed or realized by product like cloudify or aria absolutely yeah.